You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. How's everyone doing tonight for this Monday Night Live? Uh, call in show number two, Electric Boogaloo. So brace yourself. We got a little bit different equipment set up this time. So hopefully this will make the call in shows a little bit smoother. Just to kind of show you the back of the queue system that we have here this time, we have my lovely wife who is going to be taking the phone calls, jotting down your information for the gift card giveaway, and then she'll be patching you in. And then if you get a little bit too salty, she has the ability to just basically kill it. So uh, yeah, I don't lose my YouTube channel, which would really stink for me. Um, so she's going to be back there in the queue. Right now, let's get to the main guest. This guy uh, I had on the show, I think he had like over, what is it, like a 1,500 views on YouTube and close to 1,000 downloads on Apple and Spotify. And then he backed that up by winning like, what, six tournaments on the same day. And I guess he doesn't have to go to work anymore. Um, Jake, dude, you had a hell of a weekend, bud. Yeah, it was a, it was a good weekend. Um, I'm <laughs> not going to complain. I what have you been up to recently before this big tournament? Was this like the first tournament you fished since we talked? Yeah. Um, I took a, I took a big step back from the national scene this year with the cost and expenses of travel and everything. So I was mostly just going to fish local stuff this year. And this was the first national tournament that came home. So I've been uh, following your YouTube stuff uh, a, a lot more since our conversation. And it, it's, you really are on that river a lot. And with that said, do you, the bass boat guys talk about this a lot, about, and I, they call it jackpotting tournaments, which I don't, I don't like that terminology for it, but it's your home water. Right. If you wanted to take a shot at this and let's say you're going to fish like the, the, the BOS series, I feel like you're pretty damn good on smallmouth rivers. Where else would you want to like work on your game to kind of round it out? Um, so I, there's a couple different lakes here locally in the central PA region that are incredibly difficult to fish. And whenever I really want to hone a skill before I go, you know, if, if I'm going to travel somewhere to a big national event, I'll typically go someplace like Lake Marburg or Gifford Pinchot. Um, <clears throat> between the two, you basically have everything that you could potentially see. Um, you know, on a national level, it's somewhere else, you know, Marburg has the rock and the deep water and deep water grass and Pinchot has shallow, you know, grass flats with mats, um, you know, and I'm only a hop, skip and a jump away from any tidal fishery that I want to go to, whether it be the upper Chesapeake Bay or the, or the Potomac, you know, it's two hours, an hour and a half to the bay and two, two and a half to the Potomac. So, you know, <clears throat> I can do really anything like i'm in a really good region really good area to really practice you know before the before the events so could, could tell the audience at home for the people that are listening like what, what generic area you don't have to give out your zip code but like what area of the country are you in now on the susquehanna because susquehanna is just it's massive so i live in hershey um i live in hershey pennsylvania and that's about 20 minutes to the harrisburg city island boat ramp I could probably be at Middletown and the closest boat ramp to me is about 15 minutes away in Middletown. Oh, wow. Um, <clears throat> but I mean, I fish all up and down the river. I haven't spent a whole lot of time this year fishing too far north. Um, but I mean, Jeff and I just went up to I'm um, getting I'm getting cowboy hats on on TikTok because I'm live on TikTok right now. So I uh, appreciate that. But um you know, I, I, Jeff and I went up to Liverpool earlier this week and we did like a B to A type thing where we went to Liverpool and we were going to motor upstream fishing up to Port Treverton. I mean, that's, that was a 12, 13 mile jaunt upriver in kayaks with, you know, little kayak motors and good Lord, I made it. Jeff didn't, Jeff had to float back to Middletown, but we did a little one V one competition that day and I actually bested my total that I won the MAKBF and PA Bass Nation tournaments with. I had 94 and three quarter inches in the, in those. And then I had 95 whenever I was one V one against Jeff. So <clears throat> that's freaking awesome. How, what was your preparation like going into this event? <laughs> You're going to laugh. I, 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 I stayed off the river for a week. 
Ah, I, think. Um, I stayed off the river for a week and, um, you know, I honestly, I was sitting here Friday night and the tournament director was staying at my house because he's a close friend. He wasn't fishing, so he just needed a place to stay and be local. And I was sitting here and he's like, so where are you going to go tomorrow? And it's like Friday night at 10 p.m. And I'm like, I don't know. Like, it depends on when I wake up. Like, if I wake up at 4 a.m., maybe I'll travel north. Um, but if I don't wake up till, you know, 4.30, 4.45, then I probably won't. I'll probably just go somewhere really close to home. And, of course, you know, after telling my brain that, I woke up at like 4.30 and I was like, well, I guess I'm going to go go somewhere close to home. And fortunately enough, the fish, the right, I knew, I mean, I fish that water enough that I know that the right fish live there, but it's really tough. It gets really pressured on the weekend. So I knew that I had to, had to really make quick work of it, but, and I didn't make quick work of it. I had to, I grinded them out all day long. The last upgrade came an hour before the end of the day. But there, there's something to be said for this because I personally don't like fishing a lot of uh, tournaments on the tidal Potomac. I have found out when I fish less on that place, I'm better because I fished that place since like, you know, high school bass masters. It, when I fish it every single weekend, I never finish as high as when I take a bunch of time off and then I visit it like I've never seen it before. I think there's something to be said for that. Do, do you feel like that when, when you have that place that you just know the pulse of it? Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. Um, I think that, you know, when you remove yourself from what, so, and, and I'll give you a perfect example of that. So <clears throat> Saturday morning I launched and I was going to go and hit my milk run. I have a milk run of spots that I know that have never failed me that I can go and catch fish. Um, so I was like, okay, I'm going to go boom. And I even looked at it on the map before I launched. I'm like, boom, 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 boom. All right, that's a mile and a mile and a quarter between the five spots, you know, from the launch to the to the last spot. I'm like, that's easy. I can go bang out five fish real quick and then look for upgrades because these spots have never failed me. Saturday morning, I got to the first spot. There was no fish. I got mm. to the second spot. There was no fish. I got to the third spot. There was no fish. I got to the fourth spot. There was no fish. I got to the fifth spot. And you guessed it, there was no fish. So at this point, we're about an hour and a half into the morning and the topwater bite has already, you know, for a lot of people, uh, the topwater bite has long since been gone, right? That, you know, that fresh morning topwater bite that people like to get. Well, I knew that they would eat topwater all day. I knew that they would. Based on the water conditions, I just had to figure out where they were, right? So um, I pinned this in my hand. And hmm. I, went, I went searching and I started fishing spots. This was brand new Saturday morning. Damn. Um, it's missing an eye. Oh, wait, hold on. It's missing an eye on that side. It's all ground up. I mean, but <clears throat> um, Saturday morning, you know, it was rough. Like I said, the first five spots. So I put that in my hand and I started fishing spots that I hadn't fished in a long time. You know, I was going to places that I, that I were not part of my milk run. And, you know, it, it almost killed me fish in history, fishing mm -hmm. somewhere that was like very familiar, um, you know, being able to like, okay, well, I know that I'm going to catch him here. And I'll be honest with you. When I got to that fifth spot mentally, I was done. I was done. I'm like, well, there goes my, there goes my tournament. You know, that's what I was thinking. Um, but I pulled my head out of my butt and, and just started fishing and treated it like it was brand new water. What was the moment? What what mentally got you out of that rut? Because I think that's really hard for anglers. We always get stuck in our ways, especially if you fish local derbies uh, like Antietam Bassmasters. You have that one guy that he's just going to tie on a jig and he's just going to do that come hell or high water. Right. Like, how did you fight those demons? So I was in between going to these spots. I was buzzing a top water across anything that looked good. Right. And I was, you know, I was moving between spots pretty good. And I was just buzzing the top water anywhere that, that I could cast it to. Um, I started out with a bone whopper plopper because it's the most common one that I throw. Um, but I, I got a couple, like, you, you know how the fish will come up and wake on the bait, but they won't eat it. Mm -hmm. I had a couple of those, but I just didn't pay no mind to it. I'm like, oh, well, 
you know, that fish didn't want to eat it, whatever. So I kept going, kept moving, kept moving, kept moving. <clears throat> um, when I came around the, the, I was coming around to the tip of one of the islands whenever that fish had followed me all the way back to the side of the kayak and hit right beside the kayak and came jumping out of the water. Did you see that reel that I made? Maybe. I'm not sure. I, I did a reel on it. It was, it was a pretty epic top water eat right beside the kayak. When that fish ate, I was like, oh, snap. I'm like, I know what they want. They're on the fronts. They're on the fronts of these islands and they want, they want this bait to be moving basically the same, same speed or faster than the current. Is this thing, is this on a, uh, on Instagram? Yeah, it's, it's one, it's maybe two or three reels down on Instagram, but, um, but they wanted it really, really, really fast. They wanted it fast and they wanted it on the front tips of the islands. Um, so, it would be the um, second one in from the left on second row. I am dyslexic as hell. So this one right here? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So when I, I was coming up around the tip of that island and this fish had followed me, I'm assuming all the way back from the tip of the island and just went <sighs> that shit right there at the side of the boat. And that was a giant. It was a giant fish. Um but it clued me in, you know, it clued me into something. And I was like, okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah. You see my face. <laughs> I was like, okay. So after that, I, uh, I started working the tips of those islands. And oddly enough, as soon as I got around the tip of that Island and fished the other side of it, the same way I fished that side, I caught my 20 and a half inch, um, lunker for the day, which was the hour number three winner for the big bass power hour. Was that on purpose? How close you were to that grass edge? Is it because 100%. of that seam? Okay, one hundred percent on purpose. I like to parallel it. Um, I think that the, if you present it the way that the current's moving by that grass, it looks so much more natural. It's it's weird because it just feels like on the Shenandoah, like and, and possibly it's because we don't have as much vegetation. We don't get as many smallmouth up in in the grass, but it seems so, like on the Susky, it's different. I mean, mind you, the, the river was up. Okay, it was about a foot and a half above normal flow, um, but and that's so that was one of the reasons why I'm, why I messed up because I I the first five spots that I hit were in slack water, mm. right? And whenever I was going around to the different spots, I was cruising around the tips of islands, and that's where I was getting bit at. This fish though really kind of said, "Hey, you're not wrong. You're just fishing in the wrong spot." Like you're, you're doing stupid things and, or you're not doing stupid things. You're just doing it in stupid places. Right. So that's kind of what clued me in. And I was like, all right, let's, let's, let's sit down. <laughs> let's, let's figure this out. Greg Plank. Uh, was this, la was this last Saturday when the river was eight feet muddy at no. all? No, it was the previous Saturday. Um, previous Saturday would have been August 12th. So yeah, I, I had to work last Saturday, so it wasn't last Saturday. But for he's saying about floating grass, the frog. This, this is this has been the deal for me this summer with as much floating grass as we've had, because it has been an astronomical amount of floating grass this year, more than I've seen in years past. So that's that's interesting. But now, why why do you think black was the deal? Because like I, I hear that for largemouth, but I never thought about that with smallmouth. Um, I don't know. I really only throw two colors. I well, I throw three colors. I throw black, white, and bone. That's it. I don't. I don't try to get too complicated with it. Um, the minute that I start getting complicated with it is the minute I psych myself out. So, you know, my my tackle box is black, white, or bone. Yeah, that's interesting. Huh, that's really interesting. So, it so could be, I mean, it could have been because of the muddy water. It just was, may have been easier for them to locate. That's what I was thinking. So, but but then, at, at, when you had that clue there, and then you caught that big one, were you just going to rerun new water? Like, so I mean, the Shannon the Susquehanna is a massive river, and you don't have a two fifty on the back to where you can just mm -hmm. point hop. And so you think time management; it's got to be a thing. How many were in your area? Are you thinking about loading back up on the on the truck and going somewhere else? 
No, I never, I, I never even remotely thought about loading back onto the truck. Um, so I, I had fished the area I had fished had a lot of islands already. Um, so for me, it was, you know, after I caught that 20 and a half, which was right after I lost that big one there, um, I was like, okay, I, I literally anchored in an eddy behind the grass bed where I had caught the 20 and a half on the other side of that island. And I, I pulled up Google Maps and I was like, okay, there's boom, 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 boom. Okay, there's six spots right there that are within a half mile of me that I can go that I can go fish. <clears throat> and I went and fished them, and that's when it was like they were on every single one of them was on the front of the island. Every single one of them, I mean, they pursued it. Like, here's the thing though: like if I cast it up there and let it and let it float and just kind of like popped it, they would just wake on it and, and bounce. They didn't want it. They wanted it as fast as I could reel it. I had an eight speed reel, 50 pound braid, just burning an eight speed reel. And they, they, they wanted it. That fish, the, the one that I missed that everyone, there's so many people on, on social media that have come out, come at me and be like, you're fishing too fast. You're fishing too fast. Maybe for your body of water, but these fish live in this current and the current is about as fast as I was reeling that bait down current. If you're reeling it slower, it's not going to plop. It's not going to do what it's supposed to do. And that looks natural to them. Something moving that quick looks natural to them. It, I'm glad you mentioned that because the I think the second person we ever had call in last week on the call in show, uh, he's new to fishing. And he said, I've been doing my reading and I'm 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 kayaking in the upper Potomac. And it always says that you're supposed to be a fish dead, dead center of the river, but I can't get them there. I can only catch them on, on, on the, on the banks. I'm doing something wrong clearly. Cause I'm not doing what they say you're supposed to do. And, and it's so interesting. Like, well, the fish didn't read that manual, right? You know, if you're smoking them on the bank, you're doing the right thing. If right. you're, if you're cranking on that reel, like you just did three lines of Coke, you're doing <laughs> the right thing. It, it, this idea that it has to be like what Bassmaster says is, I think it gets people in a lot of trouble when they try to stick to, well, this is the way it has to be. Well, and, you know, in my reply to every single person, every single person that has, you know, came onto the different socials and said, Oh man, you're fishing too fast. You're fishing too fast. I'm like, I, I, I put in the comment, like, you know, I casually left out that uh, I won that tournament fishing exactly like that. You could just send him a picture of your trophy. <laughs> so, like, I mean, I might have been fishing too fast by your standards. However, I have three checks in my basement that suggest that I was fishing the right speed. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't want to sound too cocky when I say that because tomorrow it's not going to be that way. Tomorrow, mm -hmm. you know, tomorrow they might want it slow. But, you know, you just got to play around with it each day you go out and learn. Learn from what the fish want, you know, each day. And before I really want to get into your setup here, but um, we're we're, just, we're gonna brace yourself. We're gonna get into this guy. So then I'm gonna open up the phone lines for the call-in show two four zero five four two nine eight seven seven. I'm gonna pop that number up here too. Again, it's two four zero five four two nine eight seven seven. Call on in, you get a chance to win a gift card uh, to Jake's Bait and Tackle. Um, so with that said, as we're waiting for the onslaught of phone calls, good luck with that, Carly. Um, I'm placing my drink order right now. Yeah. That's good. My good waitress call. just picked up my uh, <laughs> my drink order. As we see the drink, I no more ice. ice. <laughs> no more ice. I don't need no more ice. Oh, oh my waitress is going to murder me. Uh, tip her well. Yeah. Um, what is your setup with that? Do you like to switch out your treble hooks? Or are you one of those guys who gets paranoid? Oh, yeah. that, that's me. Yeah, you have to switch out your treble hooks. Um, if you don't switch out treble hooks, I I feel like you're doing yourself a, a huge disservice. Um, there's very few baits that I would agree that you don't have to switch out treble hooks. Um, Bill Lewis, they put Mustad triple grips on all their on all their baits. Um, Evergreen typically has some pretty good treble hooks on their baits because that's what I have sitting here in front of me is a shower blow. I don't switch out treble hooks on that. Um, but everything else, I definitely for the most part switch out, and I. I prefer a round bend on topwater baits. Um, I say that having EWGs on this one. I was going to say, like, wait, what? Um, but I do prefer a round bend 
on on my on my top water baits. I just feel like it's it's less tipped in, so it's it's you know it's less it's more sticky. I don't know if yeah. that makes sense. No, no, it does. I, I fish with the uh, Aaron Martin uh, Gamagatsu ones on all my jerk baits, uh, things yeah. like that. I really like how thin and super sticky they are. Yeah, I mean, so like for a bait like this, and I think the reason why I have EWGs on here is because I needed something just a little bit beefier for this. Because I throw, I mean, I throw this on 50 pound braid and I have two rods that I'll throw it on. I'll either throw it on a Temple Fork Outfitters medium heavy moderate glass rod, which is a thick thick stick like that is a thick rod like in the the butt is like holding a baseball bat i mean it's a beefy rod um and then i the other one that i throw it on and it's and it's really only if i'm you know i'm limited on space on what i can take on a kayak so um you know if i if i don't have enough rod space to take as many rods as i want to and I only have this, then I'll, because I almost always have this rod. It's a 7.2 heavy, fast, resolved bass rod. Hmm. Um, and I just got to, I got to be more careful whenever I catch them on the fast rod, on the fast action rod, because it just doesn't give you as much play as that moderate does. So I really have to pay attention to my drag and I can't horse them and kind of got to let them do their thing. But it's I mean, always eight, eight speed reel though. Well, then uh, that's interesting because with, with the braid and the hooks that you're using with that setup, are you're just winching them, right? You're not playing them too much. I mean, on the moderate rod, on on the uh, so the seven four medium heavy is actually my chatterbait rod. If I'm using that, then I will absolutely pencil sharpen them to the boat. Um, they they don't have a chance. I'm I'm not waiting on them. I'm not playing them. But on the heavy fast, I will I will let them. I'll, I'll loosen up my drag and let them play just so I don't rip big holes in their mouth and they, they break loose on the treble hooks. Hmm. That's so interesting. Just, the heavy, the fat, it's the fast action for me that, that is the reason why I kind of loosen it up and just let them, you know, play them out. Cause I don't know the moderate, I can, I can just pull them in and no matter what they do, no matter if they jump head shake or whatever, I can just pull them in and they, you know, the moderate, that moderate tip absorbs all that head shake and all those jumps. Whereas the fast, it, it doesn't really absorb. It just pulls back. Why did you go with a whopper plopper versus a wake bait versus a buzz bait? And again, guys, we're giving away uh, $10 gift cards tonight to Jake's bait and tackle. Uh, the number is two, four, zero, five, four, two, nine, eight, seven, seven. First one there gets a $10 gift card to Jake's bait and tackle. Uh, Cause I think that's interesting that the whopper plopper buzz bait, I've heard that debate that like, it's basically, it's basically the same thing, but one has treble hooks. One doesn't. So with as fast as the current was moving, because it was up, it was, you know, five and a half feet. I think five, five and a half in between there. Uh, the buzz bait is really hard to keep on the surface. And I wanted something that was going to float and stay up on the surface that I didn't have to, you know, I mean, I, I don't know if I really could have even worked a buzz bait as quick as I needed to with, with as fast as that current was going. Like it, it would have probably been sinking consistently. And I, I, that's why I chose a bait that floated as far as the wake bait. Um, I had one tied on because that wake bait bite has been absolute fire lately i even brought one out for to talk about oh cool <laughs> i got i mean i got i don't know if you can see what's going on here in front of me but oh, I have, we're gonna go down the rabbit hole oh yeah i have a whole bunch of stuff there so um but yeah i uh i brought the baits that have been working really well for me recently and i like that it's all it's all bigger stuff and i think it's so interesting because i just won a um a thursday nighter on the upper potomac and i was swimming a ned rig was the only mm -hmm. way i could get bites and it's something super small they're hitting tiny shit on the upper potomac and then you if i look at your stuff i would think that you're probably on like gunnersville or something with how big your stuff is it's not really small mouth specific stuff and i remember when i had um the the, the man that won the new river tournament offer the hobie uh the Hobie series. And he talked about, yeah, like you can just tie on a chatterbait and you're guaranteed to catch something on the Susky. What is it about the Susky where these small mouth target almost like large mouth stuff? Um, I would, 
you know, I don't, I'm not a scientist and I'm not super smart, but I would venture out to say that our smallmouth on our river are not the same genetics as most river smallmouth. The Susquehanna has a very, very different breed of smallmouth bass. You can tell just by the way that they're shaped. I mean, I caught an 18 inch fish the other day that might have been close to four pounds. It was, it was stupid. It looked like a bluegill. Um, so I think they, you know, they're wired slightly different. Um, they do like bigger baits. Um, and, and any other, I mean, I think that, man, I'm a big bait fanatic. Like I, I personally think that fish don't have mirrors. They have no idea how big they are. So, you know, they just go after whatever looks like food and they don't really pay attention to the size. And that's why sometimes you'll find bass with stuff stuck in their mouth that they can't swallow hmm. because they don't have mirrors and they don't know that they're not big enough to eat it. So what is the general forage that you're seeing on the Susquehanna right now? Well, I mean, crawfish, crawfish is predominantly, uh, predominantly their major, you know, their, their biggest forage base, but we have a very, very good population of, of, I think it's called emerald shiners. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a real good population of those. There's golden shiners. There's, there's, um, there is some shad. I mean, the, the, the American shad is not, not so, so much anymore, but there are, there are good shad populations in certain areas of the river, but crawfish is predominantly. And that's, I think that's also why this bait, you know, the chatterbait, because if you use the right color chatterbait, and make it look like a crawfish. It looks like one of the crawfish in the river just scurrying away. And there's, I mean, there's times right now where, you know, if the river was clear, you would go out and look at the bottom of the river and it might look like it's moving because there's so many crawfish. That is, that's interesting. And good Lord, this comment section is blowing up. Um, let's see, JP, uh, what is Jake's uh, favorite wake bait? We're going to get into that in a minute. Uh, we got, he, we got JP again, the small and the Susky are not the same. I know that I, I'm asking, <laughs> I'm asking the why they're different. Example is like the new river, the new river smallmouth are completely different, but they're eating crayfish that look like lobsters. But it's interesting, like what makes them act the way they do. And for everyone else in chat, the only way you win the money is if you call in. You can't just type in questions. Um, you'll get your questions answered, but you only win the money if you call in so we can test out our new system. You guys get to be the guinea pigs. That was my uh there you go. Perfect. Lunker from sat that Saturday. I don't know how good it's showing up there. Twenty and a half. Um and then, you know, this fish, all seven inches, ate this. That's insane. That's absolutely insane. They have, they have no concept how big they are. None. Because that, that fish is seven and a quarter inches long, and it ate a, it ate a Whopper Plopper 110. Now, granted, the Whopper Plopper 110 was not in the fish's mouth. He came up and swiped at it to eat it. And it got, it stuck him on, you know, he was stuck in the tail and then he was stuck on the side of the, the gill plate. That's how, that's how he was hooked, but they don't know how big they are. That is so cool. That is really fascinating. Well, let, let, let's keep going down the rabbit hole with, with all your, with all your baits, pick, pick, pick another one up. Like I'm really interested in this again, guys, the number is two, four, zero, five, four, two, nine, eight, seven, seven. If you don't think I'm saying it right, just read it on the screen. So We'll start with right after the spawn, right after they spawned and they came out to the main river to recover and everything. I was catching them on that shower blow. This is the shower blow 105. Um, it, you know, worked a little bit slower. They didn't really want it super fast. This was the exact shower blow that I was using um, that I, I posted the one YouTube video on. But yeah, it this was the deal they wanted it slow they wanted it behind rocks they they didn't want it really in super fast water um i was catching them really good on that right after they got done spawning and, and most of them most of the fish that i was catching were right outside of a creek where they had just came out from from spawning ground um you know right outside of sherman's right outside of the con de gwinnett right outside of the Maha Tango. um uh, where was the other places I went to? I forget exactly the other places. Oh, right outside of the Swatera. Um, you know, they wanted it, <clears throat> they wanted it slow and they wanted it kind of like a walking style bait. But then after I stopped getting bit on that, um, I picked up the Jackal Pompadour Jr. This, I believe it's the Junior. No, isn't that a jitterbug? Bit. That looks like an old school jitterbug. 
No, it's it's a pompadour. It's a jackal pompadour. It's not the junior size. It's the it's the bigger one. It's got a cupped face, yeah. and then it's got these little wings on it that really displace a lot of water, and it's got a little tail spinner. So this is a much slower presentation top water um, because it it does displace so much water, and it basically looks like a little baby duck or a little baby bird that's in the water. And right around that time frame was when you were seeing all the mama ducks with all the little baby ducks and they would scurry across the water really quick. This thing was, was the jazz for about a week and a half, two weeks. Um, they were, the, the blow ups on it were freaking, they were just gross. How did you get onto that? On accident. Um, so <laughs> I was out fishing and I casted off a a black plopper that I was throwing and they were eating black that day. But I was like, man, I don't have any other black top waters in my box right now. So I was like, that was the only thing I had was that pompadour and I picked it up and I tied it on. And then after that, it was just ridiculous. Like the blow ups, they were just so violent. It was crazy. We got a phone call. We got a phone call. Go for it. Hey, caller, what's your name? What are you calling about? Uh, maybe. So far, this is working good. <laughs> and that's why I we need a new setup, because I can boot it really quick to keep the show going well. Um, because the thing with trying new baits, I think with a lot of people, and this will get into a new a question that we actually have here in the in the comment section, it when you don't have a lot of time to actually get out there on the water and experiment with new things, you don't want to waste it on a new bait. If you only have a Saturday a month, and I think that's it, it's hard for people to get out of their comfort zone. I think that really ties in with with this question that I have right here, which is James, which is uh, what's what do you draw the line with? too big of a bait um or how do you draw the line on a bait that's too big mm, that's tough i have an eight inch mag draft down there that i throw for smallmouth sometimes and that's like a four ounce bait um i have so here's one of my favorites um i have the five inch bull shad that i like to throw for the smallmouth up here um i also have this guy, this little six inch glide glide bait. Um, you can see it's pretty jazzed up there on the side. They eat that really good. Uh, I got this rat, which is super long, kind of a slender body, but they were eating that really good this this earlier this summer. Uh, I don't. I, I have a really hard time down, like picking something small. I, and to say what my line is is. If you're not getting bit, stop throwing it. Maybe bump down in size. But, I mean, five to six inches for smallmouth on the Susquehanna is not too big. I can promise you that. Eight inches is not too big. Uh, Jeff Little swears by a seven-inch jerk shad on the Susquehanna River. So a seven-inch fluke. I mean, it's they eat big stuff. But how long, how long do you give it? Is it a gut feeling, generally speaking? Like 20 minutes um, or more? No, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, what, it's like what, you know, you roll up to that spot where you always get, you know, you're always catching them and you know, they should be there and you cast it in there and they don't eat it. So you cast, you pick you put it down, pick something else up and throw it back in there and then you get bit, you know, that's how I, that's how I really determine it. You know, I'll start big and then I'll, I'll work my way down and eventually hopefully find what, you know, what they want that particular day. But I like to, you know, I like to catch the biggest fish that are there. Um, so for me, it's, it's tough, you know, it's tough to put down a, a big bait whenever I know that eventually probably one's going to eat it. I mean, the guys, so they just had a, what's today? Today's Monday. Mm -hmm. So they had a Sunday night tournament on the river in the, in the middle town area. And it took 21 pounds to win. And all of those fish were caught on an eight inch glide bait. Damn. So that's insane. Yeah. They were all piled up in a creek mouth and do threw an eight inch glide bait in there. I guess here's the thing. Like if you, if, if, so 
where I would throw those big baits mostly, where I would start and say, okay, I got to throw a big bait here, is if I know there's a concentration of fish in there, for instance, high water, right? You move into a creek mouth, that's where all the fish have to be because the main river's blown out and they can't handle it out there. So they move into the, the creek mouth or up in the creek. That's where I would be throwing that, you know, six, eight inch glide bait because the biggest fish is going to come after that thing and eat it because it sees it as the best possible meal that it can get. And the smaller fish might try to eat it, but they're not going to eat it. They're not going to be able to get it in their mouth or you might side hook them or something like that. But that, I mean, 20, I mean, the proof is in that look 21 pounds last night is or the night before Saturday or Sunday night, whichever night the river was blown out. They had a tournament and it took 21 pounds to win. And all those fish were caught on an eight inch glide bait. Mm. That's crazy. That's crazy. And cause, cause people are just afraid to throw the glide bait. And it, it is such a shame because th there is so much money being won on it now. I mean, hell, mm -hmm. there was a tournament, an up the Potomac, a Bass Nation event, won on the title Potomac on a big glide bait. I, I am shocked. I am really shocked at how many people are actually throwing that thing. Cause I thought the size would scare it off, but it's not really the case. No, um, I don't think this, this, it's not, the size is not the issue. I think it's just a timing thing. It's just a, a you know, what it, it, it's going to work. It just has to be the right time. Um, you know, I, like I said, you know, you get fish piled up in an area and then you present a big bait like that. They're going to go crazy over it. It's just all there is to it. What else you got for us? Um, well, getting back to the, the progression of where I, where I, where I went from this, this summer, we started off with the shower blow and then we went to the pompadour cause the pompadour was a little bit slower. Um, and then whenever I just picked up, I picked up a wake bait because between switching back and forth between the pompadour and the whopper plopper, I was getting a lot of blow ups that were really good blow ups, but they weren't getting it really good. I was missing some fish. So I, I picked up the wake bait because for me, in, in my mind at least, and this is how I justify it, the wake bait is subsurface. It's, it's basically a topwater bait, but it gives them a much bigger target to aim at to hit whenever they're coming up at it versus just seeing the underside of the belly. They're seeing the whole bait down there wiggling and, you know, and it's, it's creating a water disturbance, but they can see the whole bait. So after I tied that on and started throwing that probably the beginning of July, maybe mid July, I mean, it got stupid. Some of the fish were like, they, you know, they, they had this whole, this whole wake bait was just engulfed and like a couple of them. I caught a couple of them where I looked down and this is, God, hold there on, stand by. stand by. I looked in a couple of the fish's mouth after I caught them this, you know, early part of July. And this is what I saw. Good Lord. <laughs> so, so like it was, you know, all I could see was just that. And then, and now I'm out there trying to perform an operation on these fish because they have it hooked so deep. I actually considered, cause I, I think I killed, I, I think I killed a fish on accident this, this summer, but she was like 18, 19 inches. And she was just hooked so deep with that, with that wake bait that I, she was bleeding everywhere. It was ridiculous. But, um, I considered taking the rear treble hook off. But then I didn't because I was like, man, I don't want to. I mean, I don't know. I was being selfish. But um, after that, for the uh, when the when the grass really started floating really bad and coming down the river, that's when I picked up this guy. This hmm. is the Spro flapping frog. Um, a lot of people shy away from throwing frogs for smallmouth because the hookup ratio is not good because their mouths aren't big, but what I found out was with the Spro flapping frog, it, it has a lot to do with the hook. It that, The hook in this bait comes out so easily because they eat it, right? And they chomp down on it. And the other thing too is that whenever they eat something soft like this, they don't let go because it feels real. You know, a bait fish is not hard plastic, right? A bait fish is going to feel like this squishy frog. So whenever they eat it and they, they hold on to it, this hook, watch how easy this hook comes out. I'm holding the back of it, okay? Hmm. Wow. 
Okay. Like that's, that is key because they were, they were able to eat it, get it in their mouth. And I'm going to try not to get hooked here because this hook is stupid sharp, but they were able to get it in their mouth and, and hold on to it. And then that hook comes out so easily that it was just the hookup percentage was better on this frog than it was on, on, on a, on a buzz bait really. And I didn't have to worry about the floating grass because the floating grass, I mean, this thing would just scoot right over it and it wasn't an issue. Um, and I'm still catching them on this. I'm still catching them really well on this. Um, when the water's not blown out like it is, but since we've had about two weeks of, just blown out river and this has been the same jackhammer that i've been throwing and you can see she's all she's all tore up beat to death um half ounce jackhammer black it's one of the one of the japanese ones that you that, you know it's got the matte black blade and the matte black head and the black skirt um but that's been the jam dude they've been just destroying that thing and actually i got to take it out of service now because now that i look at it the hook's been out what, what is that trailer that you're using it's a razor shed in bad shed it's a z-man razor shed um and i think i've only gone through two of those in the last two weeks as well um but yeah it's i mean it's kind of it's kind of beat up it was rigged on there straight but after a couple small mouth decided to have their way with it it's not not straight no more so so now all right my wife said this should work so guys let me know if you can hear this okay hey guys just want to let you know that this is an awesome podcast it's uh great to see jake uh on the podcast but uh my question for jake first of all i just want to congratulate him on a win it's pretty pretty neat stuff uh and he definitely deserves it he puts uh his time in on the water out there but uh my question for jake is uh uh, about the big, and I might have missed this while I was on the phone here. I'm not sure if you guys talked about this yet or not, but about the glide baits is so popular now, and you're seeing it, you know, um, in the stores and on the internet, and uh, you're really, really seeing it out there. And, but does Jake, is this going to be part of his, let's say, um, arsenal of tackle, or is he going to start using these big glide baits on the Susquehanna River? Um, because I know some, some of these guys are throwing these big, uh, five, six inch, um, swim baits and glide baits out there. So just curious if Jake has been throwing them or if he plans on getting into that and learning that and, and using them out there. Um, one of the recent tournaments that they had last week, this past weekend, actually on the river, uh, the gentleman won with 21 pounds of smallmouth and he used a glide bait. So just curious if that's something that Jake, um, is, has part of his arsenal of tackle or if he, he's going to, if he uses that. Or if he plans on doing that down the road because it's just, it just seems to be coming so popular and especially on the uh, Susquehanna River. So that's awesome, guys. Okay, so this is what we figured out here. Just call the thing and leave a voicemail, and then we can play the voicemail on it. So that's super easy. So just give me a call at the end. Just leave your email address, and I'll send you the gift card there. So that is that's insightful. So I recognize that that voice anywhere. Um, I used to work part time at Bass Pro Shops. That is Buddy Long. He's the manager of the fishing shop there at Bass Pro. Um, he is a, a quite an accomplished angler himself, and I appreciate I appreciate him asking me that question. Um, I've been throwing glide baits and, and big big swim baits mostly in the fall for every year that I fish the river. Every year that I fish the river, you'll see me throw on the six inch mag draft, the eight inch mag draft, the big six and eight inch glide baits because in the fall time, whenever they're feeding up, um, they eat it really, really good that time of year. Um, that being said, it's also like I mentioned about, you know, whenever the fish are congregated in a, you know, a lot of fish in, in a small area, like whenever the river comes up, that's a great time, an absolutely phenomenal time to throw one of those six or eight inch glide baits because it's going to trigger that biggest fish in that group to, to come get it. And that's, so yes, the, the short answer is yes. I absolutely have a lot of glide baits and wake baits, like big, you know, six and eight inch baits that are already in my arsenal. Um, I tend to not put the, the usage of those a whole lot on, on YouTube. Um, but I don't mind sharing that secret. I mean, that secret's out, you know, 21 pounds on the river this weekend, that secret's out. So 
it's not a secret no more but um it, it, that's so interesting because i want guys and i know people are asking so the call in number is 240-542-9877 we're getting that to work here call in and you'll win a gift card and i'll drop it right here but no one minor one throwing a goddamn cicada so it, is it just it's a different time though that's a different time because so so nolan picked up on something we i've not seen all right let me put it to you this way the the bug hatches have been good this year but they've been they, ha, they haven't you haven't seen the cicadas you haven't seen the dragonflies you're seeing a lot of mayflies right I don't think that I don't think that gizmo works for a mayfly. Well, I take that back. I think anything works during a mayfly hatch. Um, but that gizmo was so key for the dragonfly bite. Because the when the dragonflies land on the water, the fit I watched it, dude. I went up before that tournament, before Nolan won. That was I took third place in that tournament and never even considered throwing the bug bait. Um but I went up to the Clark's Ferry Bridge and I could see smallmouth. The water was ultra clear. It was low. I could see smallmouth from the bridge standing on the, on the sidewalk. And I picked up a couple pebbles and dropped them over the edge of the bridge. And as soon as that pebble broke the water, there were three or four smallmouth looking for what was there. Mm. And I was like, okay, I, I know what they're eating. This is a fly fisherman's dream right now. Like they're eating bugs up here. And I didn't even have to get on the water to know that they were eating bugs up there. But it's it's not something it's not something that's certainly not going to work in the dirtier water that we've had this year. That bug bite would have been probably non-existent in the last two two three weeks because the water's just been too dirty. So you get, I mean, but they'll eat it. Yeah, they'll eat it. The, I mean, especially when the dragonflies are out in force. That, that's so fascinating to me, just that whole bite window, because that's something, again, like big smallmouth will, I think, generally speaking, will hit something so much smaller than a, uh, than a green one. Well, again, like I've been cashing money up on the upper Potomac throwing the, the, the TRD micro. They won't hit a regular TRD or a tube. It has to be this bitty ass thing. And you're in this down their throat. And I know it's, it's what they're dialed in on. And it shows you like when you're river fishing, you have to be really in tune to what they're doing and how, cause they will go off things real quick and onto yeah. just such a weird, just thing well, like that. It's crazy. The biggest thing I think is just, you know, just paying attention to your surroundings. Well, you know, look what's around you, right? If you're seeing a lot of bait fish flicker, you know, throw a spinner bait. If you're seeing, if you're seeing them bust on top water or, you know, on top for a lot of stuff, no matter what's there, if they're busting on top and you're seeing it, throw a top water bait. Um, you know, when the water's high and muddy, like it is right now, throw something loud and obnoxious because they're, these fish aren't sight feeding right now. They're, they're feeding them based on their lateral line. If you're not throwing something that their lateral line is going to pick up, you're probably not going to catch them. Hmm. So, you know, it's just paying attention to your surroundings and adjusting and trying, you know, try everything. If you're not getting bit, try everything. Once you start getting bit, stop trying stuff until it stops working. Right. I mean, again, it gets back to the question, like there's only so much you can read before you got to just go based on instinct and what the fish are telling you. Just because, you know, I, I've told this story a couple of times where I sucked at swim baits growing up because I listened to Bassmaster and they said like, well, guess what? If you're going to a pond, you need to throw a six inch, you know, Bastrix. And I couldn't catch shit. And it's like, well, they said you're supposed to throw this this time of year. Um, and but then I kind of like, OK, but the fish will hit a, a three incher. You just got to listen to what the fish want at, at certain times a year. They'll hit certain things and that is the right thing to throw right see, we've got we got so many messages here um let's see old line kayak fishing how much water was covered on tourney day for me um i, didn't fish. Hmm. I fished about a quarter of a mile away from the launch and I would say bouncing between the spots, I probably probably covered about five miles bouncing between the spots. But I, I mean, I was only a quarter of a mile away from the launch basically all day long. Um, I never really went far. Um, towards the end of the day, whenever the bite kind of slowed down, um, I did go searching a little bit further north of the launch where I just motored up river, and that's a, that actually has ended up where I caught my last upgrade, which is a 19 inch fish. I caught on this. Um, I threw, <laughs> I threw, there was a little, 
a little pocket that just had a bunch of oxygen bubbles sitting on top of it. And right in front of it, there was a bunch of um, that, it's called wild celery, which is that floating grass. There was a bunch of wild celery piled up and against the rock right in front of it. And I threw this frog on top of that wild celery. And as soon as I pulled it off the wild celery, it was gone. I was like, Oh boy, that's, that's a good fish. And I Mm. got the hook on it and it was the, it was the one that I needed. So, but that's freaking awesome. Oh, we got, we got a caller. Oh my goodness. All right. So plug this thing in here. Such a high tech operation we have. Hello, caller. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Oh, sweet. We got this. All right. What, what's your name? What yeah. are you calling about? Uh, this is Doc calling from Winchester. And uh, just wanted to first uh, thank, thank you for uh, having the show. It's a great show and I always enjoy it. And I just want to uh, thank Jake uh, on his uh, win. And I just had a couple of questions about up to Susquehanna uh, fishing. Uh, one is I was wondering if uh, Jake, if you ever have you ever used anything like any of the the, the structure head, uh, you know, uh, lures uh, using like structure heads or uh, uh, scrounger head fishing uh, on Susquehanna very very much. And, and, and Doc, when you mean structure, do you mean like a biffle bug type of deal? Yeah, yeah, like well, basically, you know, a swivel. You basically you got the weight with a swivel, you know, a, a loose hook, and you kind of, you know, basically you're dragging it on the bottom. It's got action, uh, but it's, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's like a biffle. Yes. Uh-huh. Awesome. So, so just to preface it, we don't have the software yet to where you're going to be able to hear Jake. So if you want to hang up, you can listen to his answer. Thank you so much, Doc. Okay, and. Go for it. So I slow down with those presentations um, two times, really, two times of, of the of the year. When it gets so hot and it's so low and it's so clear that those fish pile up in the deep holes and and that, I will slow down and I'll, I'll drag a jig in those areas. Um, and that sometimes is like the only way that you'll really catch them whenever it gets like super low down around three feet and the water is so clear that they can see it for everything forever. Um, I'll throw, you know, a jig or a Ned rig or something like that into those areas. The other time of the year that I'll throw that kind of stuff is in the winter time when, and especially in the winter time, whenever I just need it to sit there. Um, you know, Jeff, Jeff little teaches me, has taught me and a lot of people a lot about, you know, the passive action of a bait, in cold water where the bait's sitting still, but the, the bait itself is still moving, you know, using that living rubber, uh, on the jig and, you know, a type of plastic, like a last tech that's, you know, that'll stand up in the water and still kind of like wave around. Um, that's whenever I do that, I have a very, very hard time slowing down in July and August. Um, if I have to, if the water is so low and so clear that I have to do that to catch them, I will, but it's it's certainly not my first option this time of year. This time of year, it's I'm all gas and no brakes. So is that because the river is suited to that compared to like other rivers where you have to like go a little bit slower and milk up? Um, I think so. Yeah, I think because you know you think about how fast this current moves whenever it's regular. Um, they're used to you know chasing stuff down. They're used to you know, going after crawfish that are scurrying around everywhere. They're used to going after bait fish that are moving really fast. Um, you know, like I said, that changes whenever the river gets so low that there's hardly any flow. Then now all of a sudden I'm fishing just like every other smallmouth fisherman's fishing for them in the river whenever they're out in deep holes and, you know, kind of getting away from that heat, getting away from, you know, the other thing too, and a lot of people don't really pick up on this whenever they go deep during the summertime whenever it's low and clear like that especially low water and clear they go deep a lot of times to get away from birds Mm. because there's so many birds of prey whether it's eagles or or you know ospreys or whatever like and what are those the comorant things those blackbirds i hate those things but they go they go deep because the birds can't get them there and you know, when it's super low and super clear like that, that's that's a defense mechanism for them. So, when during the tournament did you think you you had it not one, but like oh shit, I might cash a check? Did you ever feel like no, 
No, not, not, not at any point during the day did I think that I would, that I had won or even had cashed the check because the way that those fish were eating for me, I assumed that they were eating for everybody else. And I lost a lot of fish that day. Um, and I say lost, I missed a lot of fish. I missed a lot of blow ups that day. Um, just because when you're working it fast like that, you're going to end up missing fish. You're, you're going to end up missing fish. It's inevitable. Um, so, but they didn't, they wouldn't eat it if it was just sitting there, if I was just popping it or anything, they wouldn't eat it. So it was, it was weird, but I figured that at any point during the day, I figured like, oh yeah, I need to keep, I need to keep catching. I need to keep catching because the river, I mean, leading up to this event, there were a couple of days I was out on the river and had 90, I had 99 inches the one day out on the river, me and Jeff went out and wow. I mean, my best five went 99 inches and that included three 20 inch fish. And, you know, you look all up and down the river and guys are just busting big fish all over the place on all the, you know, all the Facebook groups and stuff like that. And people are, you know, sharing pictures. And it's like, I mean, I didn't think that 94 inches had a chance. I figured it was going to take 97. So, and, you know, there was a lot of really, really high quality anglers in this event. You know, Jody Queen was here. Um, I believe, uh, I, I saw Russell Johnson signed up, but I'm not sure if he actually fished it. Um, Billy Dorbro, who's a local here, he fished it. Um, there's a lot of other locals here that I knew were really good, high quality anglers. And I at no point in time during the day that I ever think that I'd won. It was a surprise whenever I got back. You know, with that said, and it being it growing into one of the, the big smallmouth places to go the Susquehanna. And there are more, this is a terrible sentence structure guys, but there's more better anglers now at the Susky now, just because the kayak thing, everything's blowing up mm -hmm. with the pressure. Is the river at this stage now where the whole thing fish is good or are there just sections different and it's seasonal on what section pops? Um, I've the whole river is fishing good right now. Um, I caught 95 inches out of Liverpool. I caught 99 inches out of New Cumberland. I caught 96 inches out of Middletown, 95 out of West Fairview, 94 and three quarters out of West Fairview during the tournament. Um, I had 92, 93 out of Marysville a couple times. Um, I was up in Duncannon and had 94. Uh, a few weeks ago, I mean, the whole river, it, it's just the whole river is just, you know, it, it's popping off and I, it's even, you know, I've heard, cause I don't fish a whole lot South of Middletown. That's like catfish country to me, but I've heard, um, that even those areas down there have really excelled this year where, you know, down around Bainbridge and stuff that the fish are really doing well. Columbia, the fish are doing well down there too. But does yep. that make it easier or harder? Because I've always think so. Example is if you think the tidal Potomac in the spring is specifically, there are just sections you just you fish or you're an idiot. You're not going to get right. bit. That's how it is. Is it uh, for you game planning? Is it better or worse to say like, yeah, the whole river's on fire. You can't go wrong. Or is it better to say like, yeah, it's just this section or you don't cash a check? Um, I don't think that there's a section that you can go to right now and not cash a check, cash a check. So does that uh, make it harder or easier to make a decision then? Well, I mean, look, you know, the night before the tournament, I was sitting here at 10 p.m. not knowing where I was going to go. So, okay, how about for us, mere mortals? <laughs> I'm not, I'm not special. Like I, <laughs> I, I literally, I mean, I, I would, I would say it makes it easier because you know you can go in knowing and having that confidence that it can be won in any stretch of the river. Um, I would say that you know, there's, there's a, a couple certain spots that I have that I would go and fish. And I would know that, you know, 98, 99 inches is the goal. I'm not saying every spot that I go to 98, 98, 98 or 99 is going to be the goal, but I think 95 is the goal. No matter what, if you're going to win a tournament here, you, you know, you better have 95 inches, or if you're going to win a two day tournament here, you better have, you know, a, a, somewhere that equates to 190 inches. So, damn, damn, dude. That's insane. Do, do you guys ever use a spinning rod this time of year? <laughs> Jeff does. I don't. 
spinning rods are stupid in the summer. <laughs> <laughs> you told him that? <laughs> yeah, I tell him that every single time we go fishing. <laughs> um, <laughs> Jeff, so Jeff, Jeff is somebody I would look at and be like, he's not, he's not mortal, right? Like he's, he, he's out there throwing chatterbaits on a spinning rod. And I'm like, dude, what are you doing? Like, that's, that's, why would you do that? That's whatever. But, you Passing know, he, distance, baby. he, you know, but he proves me wrong every so often. He proves me wrong where he's like, you know, your only way you're going to catch him today is on a spinning rod. And I'm like, hmm, I'll get skunked. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind not catching fish today. I'll just sit back here and learn. Um, but it's, you know, it's very rare. I feel like that you have to, you know, you have to finesse fish them here in the summertime. It just, it, the, the conditions have to warrant it. It has to be low and it has to be super clear. And I'm talking low where there's no flow and the water you can see forever. You know, the, that's when you have to finesse fish them. But, yeah, that's so crazy to me because I don't know, just the whole finessing for smallmouth versus power fishing. And there's there's few places on the planet that you can actually power fish for smallmouth without having to do just the dinking and dunking, which makes <laughs> where you're at so special. Um, and something else that I, I need to mention because I was binging some of your videos beforehand uh, to get ready for this one. How is it you have so many H rail products? I saw the one where you're pimping out your your uh, your brand new. I want to make sure we actually we give them love your your new kayak. Mm -hmm. Is that just because of all the Hobie stuff? Like what is it so, really? You just want that extra fencing prior. Well, prior to um, me getting the innovative sportsman inflatable, I've experimented with a lot of kayaks, a lot, a lot of kayaks. Um, and most recently before the inflatable, before the, um, the innovative sportsman Osprey, I was running a, a, a Hobie pro angler 14 and I had a lot of H rail accessories that I didn't want to have to repurchase because, you know, $20 per accessory, I figured it would just be easier to go buy an $80 set of H rails and put on my kayak. Fortunately enough for me, I had had a Hobie inflatable that I had already put H rails on, but whenever I sold it, I took them off. So I had these, you know, empty H rails sitting in my garage and I'm like, not anymore. They're not empty. I'm going to cut them down and make them fit on the inflatable. By doing that, the byproduct was like, Oh man, I just created an additional fence. So these fish can't jump out as well. And on top of that, I've created more mounting space and given myself more room to put stuff. And, you know, after, I mean, I just played around with it and got them all situated how I wanted. So I love that setup. I was really thinking that it was actually pretty slick to be able to have that H rail on top of it. Yeah. Well, when, you know, he makes that boat with full length track so you can put anything on it that you want anywhere you want. I mean, you can move your seat. You can put two seats on it. You It's full length. You have full length range of motion where you want to put stuff. So that's one of the greatest parts about that boat. And then guys, I'll put a link in the episode description when this gets re-uploaded on Wednesday, again, with, with everything that we talked about here, his social media. And of course, you know, you got to give those inflatable kayaks are, are absolutely the deal. Uh, if you're going to be a, a river rat, you're running the Shenandoah river, upper Potomac, Susquehanna, places like that. Definitely give that place, give it a try. Um, what, what do you have on your schedule coming up tournament wise? Um, I have to go fish a lake in September. Oh, <laughs> What lake are you going to? Um, I'm, it, it's actually, I'm not upset about it. It's uh, Lake Nakamixon, and Nakamixon has some giant fish in it. That's a big swim bait lake. That's a lake where I'm probably going to go up there with six inch glide baits, eight inch glide baits, and just go for broke. Um, they, they've got some big, giant fish. We're talking 30 plus pound bags out of there in the springtime. Um, so, it's, it's going to be, that's going to be a fun event. It'll depend largely on the weather. Like if it's hot in September or, you know, it's, it's really in the beginning part of September. So it's going to be tough, but there's a lot of potential for big fish. That's September 9th. Um, after that, it's, it's just going to be preparation for the Bassmaster event on the Susky, the October 7th and 8th or 6th and 7th, I think. Um, you know, it's, it's the two day Bassmaster event. And I mean, it's right here on home water. Like I'm eyeing a blue trophy right now and I'm, I don't want anything other than that blue trophy. 
Well, then, so, depending on how you do this year, let's say you, you run the gauntlet and you win them all. Like at that point, are you thinking about, are you ever thinking about expanding and doing the national trail again? It, I mean, the, yes, I, I, I love fishing all over the country. Um, this year was just a year that I just couldn't do it. I had a lot of home projects and things and, you know, my kids getting ready to be 16. So car insurance just went up and, uh you know, all that jazz, just too many things at one time happened financially that made it where I had to cut back on something. And I didn't cut back on fishing. I just cut back on where I fished. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, it just being responsible and making adult decisions, is not, not fun, but I had to do it. So no, they're not, but yeah, we, we got to do them. Uh, <laughs> guys, if, if you want, get your messages in here. I don't want, I don't want to give this man too long. I know he's just go back, edit videos for Jeff and himself. <laughs> um, so Jeff, Jeff and I's one V one comes out Sunday morning at eight o'clock. Oh, both, snap. We're both releasing tournament, uh, tournament. Well, our Derby, uh, videos at eight o'clock on Sunday morning. So he's going to re release his version. I'm going to release mine. I got a little teaser coming out on Wednesday too. So you should try to do some kind of betting line for everyone's fans. That'd be kind of fun to see who. Well, you see now game. everyone's going to already know who won because I already said so. Uh, never mind. Yeah, yeah. Guys, just don't watch this program. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's funny though because Jeff, at the beginning of the day, he's like, "You want to do best five? And I'm like, "Yeah, let's let's do best five. And he's like, "All right." He's like. Well, you know, you just tell me whenever you catch one and I'll tell you. And I'm like, okay. So I was like four fish in and he messages me and he's like, I got a 16. I'm like, that's cute. I'm like, I got an 18 and a half, a 17 and a quarter. He's like, you're supposed to message me when you catch them. I'm like, my bad. <laughs> Come on, bro. Like, I need to have some upper hand here. Like this dude's a master on this river. I can't be going in and letting him get all the uh, dude that man is a busy man um oh my god we got okay we got a bunch of messages that came through all right guys again phone number is two four zero five four two nine eight seven seven let's go with uh do 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 uh we got mayhem adventures uh tore them up yesterday on a z-man trd chartreuse harper's Ferry. yeah i don't know guys i, I know i've been I've been really pimping Z-Man out right now. And again, it's just because I, I buy stuff. I'll use them first and I'll tell you if it works or not. I'm not going to just pimp out products if I haven't fished them myself. The other thing also, guys, here's a sleeper thing. I have been fishing that new Mega Bass BF, what is it? BFS jerkbait, the 70 and 80, which is in the boat. It's in the boat. I'll show that next live. Those things are banging. I gave it to my wife who launched a fish 700 feet straight up in the air. But if it's wife approved, it'll catch them. So that's a really cool, that new BFS jerk bait, by the way, give, give that one a try. Speaking um, of that, can I interrupt quick? Yeah, go for it. You need to be nicer to that young lady whenever <laughs> she's launching fish in the air, up in the air like that. I, I watched that, you know, intro to the video and. Oh my gosh. That I thought, I thought there was getting ready to be a domestic, you know, situation on the boat there. Oh, well, the, that's the next video that's dropping tomorrow. You get to watch that one where she almost murders me because I hook her. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I'll uh, that'll be a fun little short. Um, oh. as she's watching behind the queue, but yeah, but God love her. She won her first, she won her first tournament she ever fished, and now she thinks this shit's easy. Yeah, it's uh, not it's that, that's not the easy. only issue with that. Do you have any more baits that you forgot to show off? I, I, I completely forgot to ask. I thought I saw um, you put stuff away. Is there one we forgot? I got a whole box full of stuff over here, but the ones that have been, I mean, I've not hit anything as far as, you know, what, I, what I've had a lot. Oh, most no, I just, yeah. I want to make sure we got um, through everything. I mean, I would say that out of everything that I've been throwing lately, that wake bait is probably my favorite bite. My favorite bite is that wake bait because the way they eat it, it's just cool. <laughs> Like, it, is wake baits making a resurgence? Um, I think a lot of people don't throw them just because it's easier to see, you know, the visual aspect of a topwater bait is so fun. And a lot of people have gotten away from the wake baits. But like I said, you're throwing a wake bait, you're giving them a bigger target to hit. That's a good question right so, there. Um, JP, uh, that's wild. I wouldn't think a big glide would play on the Skusky. I would think that's also the big weight bake. I think it comes down to the forage. Um, and then you asked another great question here that I can answer, which is I believe the Skusky smallmouth have eerie g genetics. I think it's forage based too. I think it's forage based and habitat combined with water quality. So a couple things there. One, um, 
the glide baits and the big baits on the Susky, that's not new. Um, I know, do you know who Jed Plunkert is? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Jed ran a holy terror on these rivers, him and Jeff both back in 2013, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, throwing big baits. Um, you know, that's the river bassin series that him and Jeff fished. Jeff was throwing a giant spinner bait that was the size of a damn paper plate. And Jed was throwing like six and eight inch swim baits. Um, you know, they, they, these fish are accustomed to eating big stuff. Um, it's just so, it just so happens that big swim baits are becoming more readily available where before they were, they're still very expensive, but they're, you know, you can find them now, you know, commercially commercially produced at Bass Pro shops. You know, Bass Pro has a couple big swim baits out. Um, the Spro Chad Chad thing, the KG, KGB Chad Chad that just mm -hmm. came out. I know it's hard to find them in stock, but my point is, is that you don't have to go to a custom bait maker and pay $100 for a custom swim bait anymore. You can go buy one on the shelf. And I think that's why people are starting to finally, it's starting to click like, oh, snap, like this, this works here. Like, yeah, it does. It's been... It's been like it's been working for. I mean, there's been a lot of money on been won on those big swim baits. It just never really got talked about. Um, Do you feel like it'll last though once everyone starts throwing them? Mm, I think most people don't know how to throw them, so yes, I think it's going to take a little while. Um, I think I think it's built into these fish to to chase after the, at least the biggest fish. They're going after the biggest meal, and in the certain times, it's not going to work all the time. But in the fall and whenever when there's high water, I, I really feel like it's going to continue to work for a while. Um, but to his other point that he said about those fish having eerie genetics, I don't know so much if it's eerie genetics as much as it is like New York Finger Lake type genetics. Because, you know, you look at some of the Finger Lakes smallmouth that are getting caught. I mean, wasn't well, there was like almost an 11 pounder caught out of Cayuga this year? Yep. I mean, those fish, the Susquehanna starts in New York, in Binghampton. Um, you know, how much those fish move around in the different waterways up there, I don't know. But could that be their genetic line? It's probably more likely than the Erie because Erie is six and a half hours away and there's no body of water that flows directly from Erie into the Susquehanna. So well, that one would be tough. And, and you mentioned Cayuga. Cayuga. Cayuga has gobies in it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. that, it was discovered five years ago that they, they have a population of gobies in it. So it's got the bait that's needed. It might have the genetics and, and guys, you know, I just had Joe love on the show a, a week or two ago, the guy that runs the Maryland department of wildlife resources. And, and, you know, he really talks about like, it's not just the genetics, but it's also, do they have the food? Like, right. are they able to eat? Well, on they the certainly, earth? they certainly have the food here. Yeah. Before, like you guys have the food there. You got the food to do it. The upper Potomac just does not have the food quality. And I think we also have an issue with, um, I think genetics are an important thing on the upper Potomac because I think we got destroyed. The Shenandoah got destroyed with water quality. Um, right. And that's an interesting thing because I just released today an episode with Alan, who's a three generation farmer um, up on the Juliata. And so I got to talk to him a little bit about I'm listening. what he thinks about agriculture and and the runoff issue and this is something i've always wanted to ask jeff about too because i believe jeff is a farmer as well or comes from a farming background and it's interesting when they talk about the phosphates and how government has their view of what should be put into the soil and the way that they need to actually go about agriculturally well, what happens is that creates an issue where you have the runoff of pesticides into the waterways because they would rather you use more pesticides. Um, and long and short of it, you guys can go listen to that podcast. It's interesting. But the way they're doing it now is to prevent you know phosphates from getting into the water. And what ends up happening is now there's more pesticides in the water because of just you had to pick one or the other. And I'm wondering if having all these pesticides in the water are affecting fish behaviors and insect behaviors. So to that point, I would say, you know, you, you know how big of a proponent I am for catfish, specifically flathead catfish. <laughs> um, so I'm going to, I'm going to switch gears on you here. And I'm going to tell you that the single biggest threat to these fish is the amount of farming that happens in the Susquehanna river Valley and the amount of pesticides and everything else that gets put into this ground. Whenever there's runoff, whenever there's high water, there's always fish that have lesions and, and, and sores on them and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> the single biggest threat to these fish, to this fishery, is the, the, 
the the runoff that happens from from all this farmland here. Um, I think the only thing that keeps the Susquehanna from from falling victim like the Rappahannock and the Upper Potomac is the vast nature of how big the Susquehanna is because there's a lot more water here to dilute those pesticides and stuff like that. Oof, boy, that was, we just hit a subject in the chat. All right. Um, aren't the pesticides creating, um, yeah, hermaphrodite bass? I don't got, yeah, just rocky horror shore fish. I want to make this clear though. It is not the farmer's fault. And this is what was really enlightening to me is I know anglers complain about the farming and I didn't realize until I started to talk to them that this is what the government's basically telling them to do or, or right. some organization. So please understand it's not them. They're just trying to make a living and they're told what to do by the government. It's we got to talk to the government officials about, is this the best right. way of going about it? I mean, the farmer, I'm pretty sure the farmers, you know, only use what is legal for them to get. Right. So mm -hmm. what the government, you know, the government has determined is safe for us for them to get. So that's what farmers are using. It's not like they're going out there making their own pesticides, their own chemicals and stuff like that. They're only getting what's determined is to be acceptable for them to use. When is the shoe going to drop on all these pesticides? Because you look at Gunnersville had this big issue. They're out, uh, I think it's the Alabama River had this issue where the amount of pesticides they're dumping in the rivers. And they're saying, like, don't worry, we're the professionals. We know what we're doing. At some point, there's got to be a set that's going to be coming out that says, by the way, guys, this will make you grow a third eye in 20 years. Like, um, it, I feel like at some point that's going to drop. I don't want to get too political on you, but I mean, it's, I don't know if it's ever going to drop. Who knows? I mean, they keep telling us to keep taking vaccines. So you know, that's true. I mean, <laughs> I, but it's just the amount, even like the, um, the spraying of the flies and stuff. And I know I saw oh, a couple of helicopter oh, pics. God. <laughs> I was sick for days. Really? Four days after that. Dude, I, so some people were going to argue with me and tell me that it was air quality. It was this, it was that. Because it was right after we had that that Canadian fire crap, you know, locked down in the area. It was around the same time frame that that happened. But I literally got directly sprayed with that pesticide from the helicopter that was spraying for black flies. Good Lord. I mean, the dude knew that I was there. He saw me. I looked at him like he was he was right there and he started dropping that orange stuff out the back of his helicopter. And I'm like, oh, that's great. I can taste that. Like, that's fantastic. And then the very next day, I was sick as a dog. Was it the air quality? I don't know. I don't believe it. I don't think it was the air quality. I want to I mean, it happened to me. I was there. I think it was the pesticide. They say it's safe for humans. I don't think it's safe to spray a human with pesticide, no matter what kind of pesticide it is. I don't feel like it's safe. Well, and when you guys are saying like it's OK because of how much we're using per water, well, then drop it in the water and have somebody drink out of the tap. Prove it to us. Like, I, I, I don't know. Like there's something doesn't make sense. And and I, I was reading this one um, scientific journal based on what's going down in Alabama, and they keep saying the stakeholders and constituents. Who the hell are you talking about? Because in most places, the Department of Wildlife Resources are completely funded by fishing licenses. Right. So you should only have one stakeholder. Right. Um, I had an episode that dropped where I was talking about Lake Manassas, where they're paying, they're, they're spending $80,000 a year to keep people off the damn lake for a golf course. And it's like, it's insane, but it's just like the amount of manipulation that goes into some of these places is absolutely, I think would boggle the freaking mind with what's going on. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think getting back to the point, you know, that, that we need to figure out something to keep these pesticides and herbicides and everything else to keep these out of the, out of the river. I don't know how we do that. I don't, I don't know how we do it. Um, I don't know, you know, if it's, I don't know, but I can tell you that that's the single biggest threat to this body of water, even more so than flathead catfish. Uh, yeah. We raise awareness. Um, yeah. I mean, your river keepers, you know, and that, that's that's something that I've, I've called the river keeper twice for the middle Susquehanna already this year um, because I've been out, you know, I'm out quite a bit and I see a lot of things. And, you know, I called him about getting sprayed with the helicopter and I called him about a discharge coming from the shoreline up north this spring um, that I didn't know, that never had seen before. Um, he investigated both and, you know. 
you have a phone and I, I stress this for all the fishermen that are, that are listening. You have a phone, you have an iPhone 25 in your pocket with a great camera. Take a video. If you see something on the water, um, when there was that big fish kill because of, uh, allegedly as commercial fishing back, they decided to go net the day of a BFL. I got that f- footage, turned it into a short and I had the DWR call me like the next day because it went viral and it trended and yeah. they couldn't ignore it. If you put it out there on social media, they can't ignore it if it gets too big. And that's the one yeah. bonus we have right now is we can kind of unite over that. Yeah. I mean, that that awareness of that stuff is is important. The biggest thing is knowing who to contact for yes. even for the ones for the people that aren't social media savvy, you know, for the the 65-year-old guy that doesn't really do a whole lot on his phone but call his wife and his kids. You know, put a phone number in your phone, find out who your river keeper is, mm-hmm. find out who the people are that are protecting that body of water that you cherish. And I 100% cherish this, this river. I don't ever want to see anything bad happen to this river. Um, no, right on. And then take a video of it. So you're just, you're not saying like, this is what I saw. You can just send them the, the footage. So they have evidence of, of what it was. Good Lord. We have some messages here. Uh, devil dog fishing, the shoreline rescue project of gunpowder river did amazing things. National geographic did a great show on what they did to save that river with the help of the farmers. Are there programs by you? I river keepers definitely would be one of them. Yeah, I know the Susquehanna River Keeper does a lot of cleanup stuff. Um, they've had a couple different cleanup actions that they've done so far this year. Um, so that's that's really good. It's a really good thing that they have that. I don't know of any you know other nonprofit or any other type of community organizations that are doing that. Um, I know that there there's the Susquehanna River Keeper and a couple other people are really fighting with the the folks that own the Conowingo Dam right now to clean up that area, but I don't know if that, you know, with Exelon, I don't know if how far they're getting with that. What's that fight about? Is it about like removing the dam or getting them to pay more money to fix things up? I think, I think the, the idea is to get more in terms of to like clean it up more often and to clean the sludge that's basically built up down there because you're getting a lot of water quality issues in the upper Chesapeake Bay because the Susquehanna is the biggest tributary to it. And, you know, the Conowingo has just piled up nastiness for how many ever years. And I just, I think that's, I think that's what it is. Um, I don't know. So I don't want to speak intelligently on it. I don't know what that fight is exactly about, but I, I wish they would just run across that bad boy with a skimmer every so often. Cause when you drive across it, like you can see trash just floating right up against the dam. It's nasty. Um, it's gross. You know, the between like you see a bunch of logs and stuff jammed up against the dam and then in every log there's 38 plastic bottles. You know, that's not good for the water quality issue either, no. either, you know. So um, I don't know exactly what they're what all their fight entails, but I know they're fighting with Exelon right now about that because Exelon is like, well, it should be Maryland that pays for it or it should be Pennsylvania that pays for it or it should be government <laughs> us that pay for it. Like it, it's, you know. Somebody needs to do it, regardless of who pays for it. You know, honestly, if we're really if in a perfect world, New York, Pennsylvania, Maryland and Exelon all pitch in together and pay for it, because that's where the body of water starts is in New York. It mostly in Pennsylvania. And unfortunately, the Conowingo is in Maryland. So somebody needs to pay for it. Some group of people. I agree. All right. We've got a couple more questions here, guys, and then I'm going to let Jake go. He's a busy man. Uh, Ray, what do you say? Tom is having a bad hair day. Yeah, I'm dealing with <laughs> software. I got, I got, I ordered, I bit the bullet and I bought a, the roadcaster and every, all this other stuff. It's not going to be here for two weeks. So I tried to do something else for the phone calls to patch it, but it did not work. So that's why my hair looks like it's being ripped out. Ray, um, let, me, let me respond to Ray real quick. Hold on. I'm going to go back to the chat here. And I got a message from from Thomas's wife that says, "OMGGGGG, fix your hair." Yeah, that's the, that's <laughs> so he right. he knew about it. He knew about it and just chose. Oh to shit, you're life. right. Yeah, she did say that. <laughs> fix my hair. Shit, I can hear her laughing in the other room. That's fantastic. <laughs> Uh, the, the next one is uh no wait there it is this one i thought was interesting for jake in the susquehanna river where is the cleanest water i am guessing anywhere upstream of harrisonburg um anywhere outside of a creek most of your creeks right now 
I mean, I, or I'm hoping I'm thinking he's talking about right now because right now yeah. the river is just completely chalked with with mud. Um, but like today, I was out fishing for a few hours this morning, and I fished below where a creek came in, and it was you know that green borderline clear, real close to the shoreline. So anywhere where you got a creek coming in right now is is going to be where you're going to find the cleanest water. To that point on Saturday or Sunday, whichever day it was that they had that tournament, that 21 pounds was caught. I mean, I, I'm not afraid to say it. It's not my story and it's not my spot, but it was caught in the yellow breeches, um, which is a trout fishing creek, a creek hmm. um, that dumps in just below Harrisburg. And that water was absolutely gin clear. And that's where those fish were caught at. 21 pounds of smallmouth right at the mouth of that creek. Um, so right now, the typical of the river, the river will get the, the turbidity is absolutely bad right now. But what happens here on this river is when we get high water, the creeks shoot up super quick and then they drain out into the river. And then two days later, you you see this gradual spike in the river that, that typically will you know raise up and be at dangerous levels. It will take probably a week and a half for the river to clear up, a week and a half of no rain for it to completely clear up um, because there's a lot of water, a lot of dirty water coming down through it. So that's that's a good deal. And guys, I'm going to I'm going to have Jake back on uh, in the fall, kind of doing it. Uh, I don't know to see where he's going with his October uh, push for, for glory. We got one more message and then when guys, I'm going to shut this off. We're going to be done ski. I'll leave this up for a little about 20 minutes later and then I'm going to <clears throat> privatize it, polish it up and then it'll be re-uploaded as a podcast and on YouTube on Wednesday. William, you get the last one, Barnes. Uh, the the I, I'm going to say, I'm going to assume you said I disagree, but disagree on the Conowingo is over who is going to pay for the removal of the sludge, i.e. the electric electric company, which means the consumer of the power is going to pay and or various government entities. Yes, we always pay for it, 100%. Yeah. Jake, thank you so much for coming on. No um, I really appreciate it. Congrats on your wins. Thank I, you. It can only go up from here. It really can. I hope. I'm hoping. I'm Like I said, I... You know, I don't I try not to I try not to be arrogant whenever I say this, but in my mind with this, you know, with Bassmaster coming to the Susquehanna in the latter the early part of October, I'm only focused on one thing. And that's a blue trophy. Like if I don't get a blue trophy, second place isn't cool. Like I want to win. It seems like when you beat Jeff before or after a tournament, it's good luck. So just keep doing that. <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll keep trying to beat Jeff. But every time when one of us wins, the winner has to buy dinner. I bought $38 worth of Burger King that day. Good God. I can't afford to keep beating him. <laughs> I didn't know he could eat like that. That's insane. Uh, he's like, can you get me a milkshake and two cookies? And I'm like, God, dog, man. Like, all right. <laughs> uh guys again like and subscribe to jake uh check him out on i guess you said what you're on instagram twitter facebook no YouTube. not twitter um i i have instagram which is p it's the same across the board for all my social medias pa dot kayak bassin and it's on instagram facebook and tw and yeah i almost said twitter tiktok um I'm, I'm i'm enjoying that tiktok platform i like music and i like putting music to my stuff so what are you at with TikTok? Uh, I don't know. I'm like three, uh, close to 3,000 followers. Let me look. I don't know. Um, 3,153 is what I'm at for followers. Hell yeah. But I had a video that that heartbreak there, that whopper plopper that, that went really good recently. It went, it got 51,000 views. And then I have a flathead catfish video that, I was hating on the flathead catfish and has 103,000 views. So had a couple of videos do really good that helped me shoot up there, but I need to get up even more. A buddy of mine's helped me out with it. He's got like 110,000 followers and nice. he knows the algorithm and how to do it. And I don't. So he's showing me the ropes. What do you like an NPC stuff is what he's doing? Like the NPC I, girls? I, no, he's all his stuff is fly fishing. Oh, really? Yeah. He just, yeah. yeah, algorithm makes no sense. I could drop a short on TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook, and it'll track differently on each one. It's insane. Yeah. It, it does not make sense. None at all. Jake, thanks so much. Again, link in the episode description to all the social media handles and sponsors included. Guys, like and subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. 
Fishing in DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.